Okay. What, what's happening, everybody? I hope you are all having a great week. Um, today is Monday. It is June 22nd. On this day, 28 years ago, I was born. Yes, yeah, so today's my birthday, um, and, and I'm going somewhere with this. Um, I want to talk about the importance of birthdays. Today's my birthday. But I want to talk a little bit about, you know, when, whenever your birthday is, um, first off, if you live to see another year, you know what that is? That's God's grace. That is God's grace right there. Because he has allowed you to live as long as you have. The reason why you're still alive and still breathing is because of God's grace. I want to touch on something, though. This is something, um, if you saw me put this up on my Facebook and Instagram and all my other social media platforms, I put up like 10 lessons or or I think it was 10, maybe 11, I don't know. But there was some lessons I learned during COVID-19. I think it was actually seven, now that I think about it. But I'd have to go back and check. But one of the lessons was never take your birthday for granted. And I want to expand on that today. I want to expand on that. So, uh, without further ado, we're going to begin in Job chapter 3. Now, let's get let's get the background. Because uh, one important uh a uh, thing when studying the Bible, you need to know the context. Again, as I've said before so many times, so many people today take the Bible out of context. So we're going to put it in its proper context. So, Job chapter 3. We're not going to read the whole chapter, but we are going to read a few verses just to highlight what he was saying. But to give you some background, chapters 1 and 2, Job basically... Lame, uh, to put it in layman's terms, lost everything. In chapter 1, we see that he lost his flocks and all his possessions and his sons and daughters. And and servant after servant comes to him and says, Hey, uh, this happened, and I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. And then after that person came, another one came and said, Hey, this happened, and I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. And, you know, the cycle goes on. And then first, Job, <laughs> this was God basically testing Job. Because what had happened was the devil had gone to God. If you, you'd have to go back and read Job one and two to see, to get Job chapters one and two to get it. But Job one, the devil comes to God, and he and God's like, "Have you considered my servant Job?" Um, and he's like, "He has not. He he fears the Lord and shuns evil." So God's bragging on Job, and then. <laughs> And then the devil goes, well, it's only because you gave him everything. And then and, and he said, well, if, if, I ta- if you take away everything from him, then, uh, then he will surely curse you. Well, God didn't necessarily take things away from Job. He permitted, he said, he said, okay, he gave the devil permission to take away his things. And so he said, but you must not harm him. That was the only condition. And then what did the devil do? The devil went uh, went out and, you know, all the, all the bad stuff started to happen to Job. Chapter 2, uh, God, God and the devil are talking again. And guess what God uh, says? I want, to, I want to read this to you. It says, the, then the Lord said to Satan, in Job 2, 3, he said, then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil, and he still, still maintains his integrity, though you incited me against him to ruin him without any reason. God basically said, hey, hey, Satan, he still got his integrity. And then Devil goes on to say, skin for skin, Satan replies, a man will get if all he has for his own life. Verse 5. But stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you to your face. And that's the devil talking. And verse 6, the Lord said to Satan, Very well then. 
he is in your hands. In other words, he gave Job over to Satan and said, you can take away his good health. But he said this, but you must spare his life. That was the only thing. That, and so that's basically Job 1 and 2. Job lost everything. His possessions, his health. And ver and but he really start the the pressure starts to really mount up in chapter three. So that's what we're gonna read. Without further ado, let's go ahead and dive in. Job chapter three. Now that we know what Job's been through, this is what's happened. After this, after and after what? After all that happened before. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. He said, and this is what ha he said. <laughs> May the day of my birth perish, and the night it was said a boy is born. That day may it turn to darkness. May God, above, may God above not care about it. May no light shine upon it. Now, when, now I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but do you realize how depressing that sounds? First off, look at this. If we read, if, you know, I could read the whole chapter, but I want to highlight a few things. Job was just broken. Broken over this. We, we do understand his situation. But to have to go and say, and, and curse the day you were born? Mm-mm. Now, Job may not have, now, in... If you study the book of Job, you will know that Job never accused God of wrongdoing. He never did. But Job does speak out of line when he says, May the day of my birth perish. Yes, he's in despair, but listen. Bad things are going to happen. Okay? If you were to read the book of Job... Man, you, got, you would have come away with a completely different perspective. The prosperity gospel preachers never, ever mention the book of Job. You know why? Because it, they can't explain it. They can't try. They can't understand why he, he was so wealthy and why did bad things happen. Because it doesn't match their theology. And even if they do, they always, even if they do mention Job, they always twist it to fit what they believe. But Job is a perfect example of, of bad thing, you know, when bad things happen, what do you do? First off, I want you to understand, never curse the day of your, your birth, okay? Number one, okay? Never do that. Why not? God gave you life on that day. You are basically saying, if, if you, and, and you know, I used to be this way. Be what? Well... There was a time when I was younger, and I didn't know Job 3 by heart. I only knew a few parts of the chapter. But, I, but whenever something bad happened to me, or whenever I was in despair, I would often say, make, I would often say things against my birthday. And, I, and you know, that's not, that should, that's not a wise thing to do. Because God gave you life on that day. At the least, the, what, what you should be saying is thank you. Because God could have chosen to not give you life today. He could have, maybe he decided, may, who knows? Maybe you, no, you would not be here if it were not like, it, how am I, how can I explain this? I'm, I'm tumbling over my words right now, but what I'm trying to say is that God allowed you to be born for a reason. You are not here by accident. You are never here by accident. Well, then what, are, what am I? I'm glad you asked. Number one, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are fearfully wonderfully made. That's Psalms 139, verses 13 and 14. David says, For you created me. This is David writing to the Lord a psalm. He's saying, You created me in my inmost beings. Inmost being. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. 
I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. So God doesn't make mistakes. God never did. He doesn't make mistakes. He didn't make a mistake when he made you. Number one. Number two, you are made in the image of God. Genesis 127 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. You, my friend, have been given life on this earth to be an image bearer. In other words, you are created to give glory to God. That is why you are alive today. Why you exist is for God's glory. You exist for him, not for you. It is not about you. Life is not supposed to be about you. It's about how can you give God glory with your life. Number three, you were bought with a price. God considered you so important, he bought you with a price. Paul outlines this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 23, he says the exact, he uses the exact same uh, phrase, verbatim, word for word. You were bought with a price. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, he's talking about sexual immorality. And he's talking about the temple of God. He's saying, um, basically, let's look at verse 19. In the, the verse before, it says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. So in that context, Paul is saying, hey, listen, you're, you were bought with a price. In other words, when you were bought with a price, in other words, God bought you back when he died on the cross. He paid for your sins and he freed you. He bought you back. You were once a slave to sin. But God freed you when he paid for your sins. God gave you freedom in Jesus Christ. And, the, and what does he say? He says, therefore, because you've been bought with a price, honor God with your body. In, ver, in verse 23 of chapter 7, Paul is, this is the context of marriage. It says, you were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. Okay, so the point here is this. You are so special that God bought you with a price. Or he, he, he bought, you were in, a, I mean, I mean let, me, let me make it clear. You were bought, I mean, you were just so precious to God, God had to have you. And that's why he sent Jesus. Why? Why would he want to buy me back? Well, for one, he loves you. John 3.16 is proof of that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. For God so what? Loved the world. He so loved the world. That means every single person on the planet. He loved them so much. What did he do? He gave. He gave of his son. Why? Because he wanted, to get, he wanted you to have a way to get an eternal life, and that can only be achieved through a relationship with Jesus Christ. He also bought you with at a he he also bought you back because he wanted to save you from the empty life on this earth. First Peter chapter one, verses eighteen through nineteen highlight it this way. Let's read that. Let's read those verses for a minute. Verses 18 and 19 of 1 Peter 1 says this, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you redeemed from the empty way 
philosophy of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without defect. So Peter basically says, look, God didn't buy you back with literal gold or silver. He bought you back with the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what he did, all out of love. And another, other, how about this? Number four, you are God's masterpiece or God's workmanship. Ephesians 2.10, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. You were created to do good works, to do things that please the Lord. That's what that the miss you you exist to give God glory that goes back to the same point. You are an image bearer. You are someone who is supposed to make the name of Jesus famous through your actions and your words. How about this one? Last one. You're forgiven. That ought to put a smile on your face. You're forgiven. If you are in Christ, then you are forgiven. And you're a new creation. And 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. How about this? Romans 8.1 For there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. Psalms 103.12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Hebrews 8.12 says, He will remember our sins no more. Friends, your birthday should be a day where you celebrate the goodness of God. Never take your birthday for granted because God, he probably... He could have just not let you live another day. He could have taken you yesterday. But the fact that you're alive today shows that he loves you. He is gracious. He is merciful. And if you don't know Christ, he probably, most likely, he's allowed you to live because you haven't received his son, Jesus, yet. And he knows that if you were to die, you, were not, you would not be ready. But you are special. So whenever your birthday comes around, whether the, your birthday is January 1st or December 31st or whatever day of the year it falls on, always celebrate the day God gave you life. I'm thankful today that God has given me 28 years. It is... It's humbling. <sighs> he didn't have to give me 28 years, but he did. He didn't have to allow me to live this long. He could have just, I could have died last night. But I'm still here. Because God gave me another day and he's given you another day. And maybe for those of you who, maybe you were physically born. Yeah, you know, I heard somebody say it like this. Born once, die twice. Born twice, you die once. <laughs> for, the, for the believer, there are two birthdays. What? Yes. There's your physical birth, the actual day you were born, where you were born from your mother's womb. But there's also your spiritual birthday, when you were born again. Have you been born again? Jesus elaborates on this concept with Nicodemus in John chapter 3. And Nicodemus is like, how can a young man, how can an old man go back into his mother's womb to be born? And Jesus is like, no, 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 that's not what, he, he Nicodemus was thinking literally. <laughs> he was thinking very literally. So Jesus explained this to him and he says, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not, it says flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. He's like when he said, when he's talking about being born again, he's not talking about literal rebirth. He's talking about 
when it says to be born again, it means to be born again spiritually. To be spiritually born. And how do you do that? Well, you receive Jesus. That's how you become born again. And by the way, when you're born again, God, because back at sec, back to 2 Corinthians 5, 17, where it says, the old has gone, the new has come. So when you are born again, your old way of doing things is gone. And now there's a new way. And you're given a new heart. Ezekiel 36, 26 uh, God says this, I will remove from you a heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. So, so maybe you're here today and you don't know who Jesus is. Maybe you have yet to be born again. And I want to share with you how you can. First off, you have to want to be saved. Okay, this desire cannot come from me. It has to come from you. I want you to be saved. But do you want to be saved? Saved from what? Well, saved from your sin. Your sin has caused you to be at odds with God. You are not in right relationship with God when you sin. That being the case, I want to give you a chance to go. I want to give you the chance to, to receive Christ today. Today could be your spiritual birthday. There is no outline of a sinner's prayer. But I want to highlight you the ABCs of salvation. One is probably the most hardest thing for people to do. Admit. Admit to God you're a sinner. You are a sinner. Let me tell you something. I, yes, we are fearfully, wonderfully made, but let me tell you something. If you don't know Christ, you stand before him condemned. That, look, I didn't, I didn't say that. The Bible said that. John 3, 19, it says, He who does not have the Son stands condemned already. You are already condemned if you do not believe that Jesus is Lord. But, you ha but there is hope. You still have an opportunity. You can still come to know Christ. I personally want to see you when when event, when Jesus comes back or whenever I go to heaven, I want to see you there. So do you want to receive Christ? First, admit you're a sinner. Believe that Jesus died on the cross. And three, confess or commit. Commit your life to him. Believe, admit to God you're a sinner. Believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. And commit. In other words, and confess. You confess your sins. You agree with God. I, what, I would di what I have did to offend you was wrong, and I don't want to do it. Help me to live a better life. And that's the key. Rely on God to change you. Now, when God tells you to do something, you do it. That's called obedience. That's a fruit that comes from a believer. Always listen to God. You, if you have any other comments or you want to talk more, maybe you want to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation about how you can know Christ. I'd invite you to send me a message over Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook, or leave, leave a comment down below. Um, and and let, let, let's start. Because today, there is nothing more important than settling the decision of your eternal salvation here and now. We need to be ready. Because have you, have you noticed what's going on in the world around us? We're not looking so good. That being the case, I leave you with that. And I hope you have a great day. And God bless you.